Hi everybody and welcome back to Talk Gnosis. This is part two of our four-part conversation with Richard Hodges about the Gnosis of Gurdjieff. In the last episode we talked about who G.I. Gurdjieff was and what his system is like. We talked about his travels and his spiritual influences, the idea of waking sleep and what doing the work in groups is like, and that was an interesting conversation. In this part, we talk about the potential development of the soul and how we have many eyes, many little personalities that kind of float around. And we talk about some of the origins of where Gurdjieff's thought may have come from. And then we wrap things up with a conversation about the body, the essence, and the personality and how those three things kind of relate, which is an interesting time into our last series with Bishop Timothy Mansfield. So uh, stick around and check out part two of our conversation with Richard Hodges on the Gnosis of Gurdjieff. So one of the things that I find particularly interesting about um, about Gurdjieff's teachings, and um, I, I mean I haven't read any of it myself personally, but I do know several people who, who, uh, who do this work and, and enjoy it very much, um, one thing that kind of resonates with me is the idea that you don't start out with a soul or you don't start out with a developed soul and that you have to uh, work over time to develop a soul. Can you talk about that? Yeah, that's a very subtle uh, and difficult idea for most people. Um, just a second, I rearrange myself. Um, what is a soul? Hmm. It's evidently he's speaking about something different from what people who call themselves Christians are talking about when they say their soul is going to heaven or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, what is it exactly, though? He, he speaks about um, higher bodies, for example, of, and there's two or maybe three different bodies that are at a different level than the physical body. And uh, one, the second body has to do with uh, probably the the organic energies that are uh, flowing in us all the time of uh, of, of well desire, a sensation. Uh, uh, wishes, hopes, and uh, but they are not organized into something that could be called a body. They they come and they go. They have their own little clusters of uh, uh, associations, uh, and uh, you know the idea of many eyes you referred to in one in your qu question sheet. It's it's that there's we're inhabited successively by by one eye and then another eye, only f often for a few minutes uh, at a time, with its own interests, its own viewpoints. Uh, you, you, I'm sorry, you mean I as in the letter I, like as in me? Yeah, right? the letter the letter I, yes. It, it, I call myself I when I'm angry at the guy who's uh, blocking my way in traffic, and I'm, ang I'm mad at him, and I think that I deserve to be moving faster and he's in the wrong mm -hmm. and that's that's one of my eyes and that ties up certain energies and then another energy I'm mean, with a person I love I, I feel benevolence and, and genuine good feeling toward them that's another eye um, but the whole thing doesn't add up to a real eye no. it's, it's just these little caricatures and the idea of the second body is if there was a, as if there could be a center of gravity that maintains a kind of an order among all these different eyes, sort of like a, a planet surrounded by its moons or something like that, and uh, that there would be a constant overview even even if these various impulses come up and and have their role in one's life, one is not totally lost to the in them, uh, because there's an overview and and a certain responsibility. So this this would be the second body, and this is uh, considered to actually to be a very advanced development already. But I think that the mo a subject which is 
re- really quite interesting and probably too too subtle to uh, to go into now is is the third body, which is a much more mystical uh, entity. And perhaps this is more connected with what's usually called a soul in religion, mm-hmm. because he does he does specifically say that this has a certain relative immortality if it if it is developed and exists it continues to exist at least for some substantial amount of time after the death of the physical body and now what this is uh i would hesitate to try and and talk about it or explain because uh, in truth i don't fully understand it myself uh even though i do understand some things about it Hmm. now how was uh how was he coming up with these ideas? Was this something that he, uh, you know, through his his own meditation and and work, kind of intuited, or um, does he claim some kind of uh, inspiration, some kind of divine inspiration for his his thought? He doesn't seem to make any claims like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and anyone who has studied the the traditions of mankind, the, the religions and philosophical and metaphysical traditions and practices can recognize uh, sources uh, for these ideas mm. uh, going very, very far back. Uh, and people are always claiming to find the origins of his ideas. Some people say, oh, it's from ancient India, others from ancient Egypt, others from uh, the Greeks, pre-Socratic philosophers. Uh, and all all of these uh, have these these ideas. The, the idea of the development of a soul is found in one form or another in all of these traditions, mm-hmm. uh, with different different emphasis uh, and different different understandings about what it is. But there's something in common, and presumably he put a lot of influences together. But he didn't. I think I think it's clear that he didn't want to be thought of as simply a, a teacher of some known teaching. Mm. And so he, he made uh, a pretty considerable effort at, at separating himself from, from, past, from past teachings. Now, there's one apparent exception to that. He, he does call his, he did call at one point his work Esoteric Christianity. Now, there's a lot of things he said one time and then maybe said something different at another time, but I have the feeling that he meant that. Uh, and he, he speaks about there having been Christianity before Christ. And he even says somewhere that Christ wasn't the most important player in the, in the Passion story. Uh, but, the, but the idea of a, a Christianity before Christ, that many thousands of years before Christ, that that had that practiced something uh, in the direction of love, in fact, uh, for for everyone, uh, which is not exactly what most people that call themselves Christians seem to practice <laughs> nowadays. <laughs> but That's but the idea is still there, even though it's been uh, attenuated. Let's say. Mm-hmm. The. Let's go back a little bit and talk about the many eyes again a little bit. Uh, the because this is a, this is an interesting concept, but it's a difficult one, I think. Yeah. Yes, um, it is. So uh, this so you you mentioned that there's a kind of center of gravity for these eyes. Now there ca- there can be a de- a center of gravity can be developed. Yeah. So a, a potential then for a center of gravity maybe. Um, right. The the next note in here is. Um, body essence and personality is this something along the same lines or is this a different concept altogether well how, how do you mean is it along the same lines yeah that, i don't know i don't <laughs> 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 i'm just reading off the paper on this one because yeah. but um yeah is, but I, I guess what what is gurdjieff's view on the body and how does it relate to all of these um other uh psychological and spiritual processes that he talks about well let's t- let's just dispose of personality briefly. Okay. <laughs> um, personality is what people ordinarily call personality is is these various eyes that mm-hmm. they have. Yeah. Uh, and essence is, by contrast, what a person really is. Uh, 
at some deep level, so some sub, even level of subconscious reality. Uh, he says in, in Beals of Up's Tales that the impulse, that what is now known to us as the subconscious needs to be made conscious, and that it's that most of our real living impulses have been driven underground into the, into the subconscious where we have no conscious awareness of them most of the time. Uh, impulses, uh, for example, the most important one is what he calls conscience, which is not morality at all, something quite different than that in the way he uses that word. But the, the idea is that, that the development of essence means the development of these impulses which have been driven underground and not really allowed to grow uh, in the way that perhaps they were meant to grow in a, in, a norm, in a human being that grew up in a normal way. Is this, a, uh, so, is this something that is common to most people, it's a, that this essence is uh, underdeveloped? Yes. It's, it's uh, an example for, that he gives and is if you go to certain countries which are considered a third world, you, you often find people of a very strong presence. I don't know if you've had that experience or not, but I, for example, in Africa, I've met some strike, really striking people that uh, they don't have much knowledge uh, science or anything, but as a person, they have a real presence. And this would be a more normally developed, or at least a more developed essence. Uh, and he, he says that uh, in, in in older times, even not so long ago, especially in certain places like that he, he was in, like the Caucasus and the Middle East, uh, a lot of people had relatively developed essences, uh, and some of them did not have a corresponding development of personalities. So one idea that he has specific for us, for Western man, is that there needs to be an equal development, that either one can get out of balance with the other, and this leads, gives an unbalanced uh, presence in the world. So we're, we're lucky, we have personality, but it's disordered and, and dysfunctional and often has some very bad aspects to it. That can be normalized by connecting it more with the essence, with this subconscious part, and by developing the, the subconscious by feeding it the foods that it needs, experiences and impressions that are needed for the essence to develop. And where do you find those uh, experiences? Well, life is meant to give us those experiences and does all the shocks of life, if they could be taken in in the right way, would would develop something in one. But people, for example, get in a, get in difficulties, uh, fights, uh, losses. Uh, losses of a job or losses of a spouse or something and they just close up they they don't open to the fact that something is actually being given in that in that experience that if they could understand it would would make them uh, more human hmm. and those those experiences are meant for essence now the the idea is that the work artificially produces certain experiences that have this same uh, possibility to be received by essence. Uh, and this is one of the reasons for a work in a group which is overseen by someone who knows how to recognize what people's essences need. Now, this is not always the case that somebody like that exists, or that that's the theory anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, just to loop back around, so what, what was Gurdjieff's view of the body, in, uh, the physical body? Right. Um, 
body is in a way the most important part because everything that takes place whether it's feeling or thought or uh, religious inspiration or artistic creation it takes place in the body not any not really anywhere else uh, and there is a very big uh, principle of which is sometimes spoken of as connecting making a connection between the mind and the body I'm not sure that people always understand that uh, but it means it means what I among other things what I was just saying that that everything is takes place in the body there are many different energies that flow through different channels in the body um, some of which are directly accessible to kind of inter, an inner look and others of them are more subtle and uh, can only be approached uh, in, a, in, a, in a more uh, in, a, in a more specialized way uh, uh, for example the work of, of let's say work of an artist or let's say a musician uh, is very very difficult and long work as you probably know to learn to play an instrument or compose music at a at a high level mm -hmm. and among other things it involves getting in touch with certain energies of musical creativity, of, of, of the sensation of tone and rhythm and so forth, which everyone has, everyone has rhythm, but they, many, many people are unable to be in touch with that. And if you start uh, learning how to play music late in life, it, it may be very difficult, but it's not impossible. Mm -hmm. And in a way, the work is kind of like that. It's kind of like learning to play an instrument that one doesn't know how to play, uh, so it's 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 a challenge. It's a real challenge, if, and it's it's and it and all the you know playing an instrument is done by the body as as. Yeah. as mm -hmm. right. If I may, if I may, I when I was uh, in the work for a couple of years, uh, my group leader called me out one day because I was talking and and I was gesticulating all over the place. My hands were going yes. everywhere. And ooh, 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 ooh. And finally he stopped me and he said, could you try saying what you just said without your hands going everywhere? <laughs> right. So with great, and, you know, and, here I, and here I was, I was in my, you know, I was in my early 40s at this point. And I, with great difficulty, I held my hands down. I repeated it. And everybody in the group said, you know, that what I said had a lot more power and a lot more weight because my energy wasn't flying in 15 different directions. Hmm. And over time, and then he just, you know, told me to try and work on that, which I did with great struggle and difficulty. Uh, it was it was a painful process, realizing just how often I automatically would move into that. Um, but I remember, you know, maybe a year later, one of the people that I worked with basically said, you know, you taught me how to keep my hands still. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he, he said, I saw that in you and, and that helped me. So that's one way in which group work is important. But it really changed my posture in, in, in life. It, it they, by working on that body manifestation, working on management of my body, it, there was a, an enormous difference uh, for me in, in many different ways. And it was funny, a couple years later, the group leader said to me, I hereby release you from having to hold your hands down all the time. Sometimes you do need to use your hands <laughs> when you're <laughs> right. speaking. Um, but it was, you know, probably one of the more remarkable but very practical uh, the things that I learned in the work and uh, was that use of the body, uh, which I was just so unaware of, and just doing something as simple as not waving my hands around when I speak, it, it was an, an incredible lesson for me. 
Mm -hmm. That's a very, very good example. Well, that wraps up part two of our conversation with Richard Hodges on the Gnosis of Gurdjieff. Part three, we cover some really interesting concepts and topics that Gurdjieff kind of made up as a way of teaching his system. We're going to talk about Kunda Buffer, Food for the Moon, Beelzebub's Tales to His Grandson, and more. Uh, I know you don't know what those are like right now, but uh, stick around and we're going to give you the whole scoop on those. We're also going to spend some time talking about symbols versus metaphors, the similarities and the differences, and then we're going to close things out with a conversation about the Law of Seven. So all of that and more is coming up next week on Talk Gnosis, so stick around and we'll see you next week. <laughs>